tonight. This is a little different, a little special night tonight. This is uh, our night of uh, uh, kicking off our international mission study. This is the night we always do, getting us ready for next month, what we begin next Sunday for our Lottie Moon offering that we take up during the month of December for our international missions. And so our, our lady, our WU ladies always kind of give us some direction and some guidance on that and share some stuff about our missionary workers and and uh, maybe even some of the people, well, we know they'll get this money. And and so Miss uh, Becky Taylor is going to share that, that uh, news with you in just a moment. But we do want to uh, begin with prayer. Thank you for being here tonight on a cool, rainy, damp night. But thank you for coming. And I uh, uh, just want to remind you, you know, this is, you know, for me, Christmas is about giving. It's not about getting something. I'm going to just tell you that right now. I could give a less of a hoot about getting anything. But I love to give. And I ain't going to lie to you. And uh, and it's giving. It's for the got the box back there for the the Gideons put back there. We just ask you to drop a little money in it and uh, uh, to help them. They're gonna be sending Bibles out this year all over the world, which is what greater mission work than it is to that. And uh, and so it's just and we'll be giving to Lottie Moon and you'll be buying Christmas gifts and giving and uh, all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, if the weather gets decent enough for me to get out there and change the sign this week, uh, we'll put it, I, I think I put this up last year, I'm not sure. Uh, Jesus had the birthday, but we got the gift. And I want to put that back up because that's really what Christ, Christmas is about. He had the birthday, but we got the gift. And so I'm hoping to get that up this week. And so, uh, again, thank you for being here. Let's, let's open in uh, prayer. Would you bow with us, please? Father, I thank you, God, uh, that we are now about to enter the Christmas season. Father, we love this time of year. It's not only, again, a time of thankfulness, but it's a time when the world received the greatest gift it ever got, God a Savior who was Christ the Lord. And Father, I thank you, God, that in this world that there are people, as Becky will come and tell us in just a little bit, that are all over the world. Many of them will miss Christmas at home this year because they're in a foreign land somewhere trying to tell about a baby that was born, a mama that was a virgin, and the shepherds that came, and the angels that led the choir. And Father, this is a special, special, special time. And God, I thank you for loving us enough to give the greatest gift of all. Father, I pray tonight, God, for Becky as she comes and shares with us about the mission work of the Southern Baptists, of what we're doing to carry our part to carry the gospel into the world and that God that we'll always make it a priority in our church to carry the gospel because we live in a day and a time in America brother Jay and I were talking a while ago where it's very difficult to see people saved anymore in church but God all over the world they're literally getting saved by the tens of thousands because there's a hunger there for the gospel where there's not in America. And God, I pray for our nation that God, uh, you might put that light back in this dark world where people will have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, instead of giving up my mission messages, I usually give it. Becky's going to share that with you. We're going to let her uh, do that. But we're just going to go ahead and sing our song. 
and uh, let our ushers come forward and take up our offering soon and very soon. Just uh, before I turn it over to Becky, let me just remind you, we will be having church Wednesday and normal regular service, continue our study on the second missionary journey of Paul. And if you remember that over Wednesday night, things fix and take a sudden turn in Paul's life. It's those sudden turns that throw us for a loop sometimes. Remember, Paul's going one way, and the last verse of Scripture, I said the Holy Ghost stopped and said, don't go that way. I want you to go somewhere else. God does that sometimes. So that's where we'll be at Wednesday night. So we invite you to come back and we'll get our good Wednesday night crowd back, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be studying that uh, again this Wednesday night. Be back in Daniel next Sunday night. I didn't get my sermon preached last Sunday night on Daniel, the, the night visions and the daydreams. I uh, kind of got chasing rabbits and got off course last Sunday night a little bit but we'll finish that maybe we put the same sermon back up I didn't go nowhere with that one last Sunday night so but I do have I'd like I told you this morning God give me a message to go along with that message like you ain't gonna believe when I was out walking this week ooh -wee, I wish Every Supreme Court judge, every senator, and every congressman could be here Sunday night to listen to what God told me or tape it, Dwight, and send it to the White House and let them listen to it. Send it to Congress, send it to all of them because they're going to need to hear what i got to say Sunday night. All right, I'm done. Becky, this is one of our WMU ladies, the leader her, Miss Colleen, that... Uh, uh, lead us in our mission work here at Southside and do such a wonderful job. And Becky is over our shoebox program here too. And of course, I ain't gonna brag on that no more. You come on, I don't say <laughs> enough about shoeboxes. So, so uh, you come on and share with us with uh, what you got. Let me get back to our seat. Good evening. That's um, the pastor said. This kicks off our Lottie Moon Christmas offering month. Our goal is $4,000, and you give often and as much as you like. We right. we don't hold that as a limit. Right. Um, he was talking about the shoe boxes, and I do know one church that I talked to, they told me, oh, we've got a, a, a goal of this amount, and we're going to make that goal, and but we don't go over our goal. And I thought, mm, okay. <laughs> But the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is also called the Lottie Moon International Mission Fund, 
or some people just call it the International Mission Fund. But here, we still call it the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And Lottie Moon was a missionary. She served in China for 40 years. And while she was there, she wrote letters to the Foreign Mission Board, which is now the International Mission Board, and she told them about her life. She told them about her troubles and how things were going, and she suggested that they take up a fund once a year to help missionaries overseas. Foreign Mission Boards looked at it, and they didn't really do anything about it. So she said, well, I will write the ladies of the churches. And she wrote the ladies at her church, and then she wrote some ladies that she knew that went to other churches, and she suggested that they organize and told them about what was going on and suggested this fund and asked them if they would help her. So the ladies said, of course. And they organized, and they eventually became what we know as the WMU. And they persuaded their husbands that this fund needed to be done. And so the fund was taken up and, and sent to the um, international missionaries, not because of the Foreign Mission Board, but because of the WMU. And that's why the preachers say you don't mess with the WMU. <laughs> Now, in 1918, we ain't quite that bad. We ain't quite that bad. But in 1918, it was decided that to give this a, a better name than just Foreign Mission Fund, so they named it after Lottie Moon. And as of May of this year. There were over 3,600 international missionaries, and every bit of this money goes to them. None of it goes for operation expenses. It goes to their salaries, to their health care, to helping them get housing, even for rent or mortgage payments on churches. So all monies go to them. And at our WMU meetings, one of the things that we always do is honor our missionaries having birthdays on that day. And I'm going to do the same tonight. Now, when we um, talk about the international missionaries, as we know, this world is not so safe for Christians anymore. So they do not give their full names usually. And what you'll hear is a bunch of initials. We may not know who they are, but God does. That's right. And these missionaries have said that they can actually tell when they're being prayed for. That it is an, an amazing thing. That they'll just get this feeling of warmth come over them, and they go, "Well, church is praying for us." So our missionaries tonight. I'm going to start with our international mission board. KB is serving in the Central Asia. DM and RS is serving in East Asia. LS is serving in Europe. And H.A. is serving in North Africa and the Middle East. J.P. is serving in South Asia. And C.M. and Catherine North is serving in Southeast Asia. Chris Erdson and K.S. are serving at Sub-Saharan Africa. And our North American missionaries are Donna Connor, and she is in North Carolina, Daniel York in Ohio, Jeff Hill in Pennsylvania, Thomas Agnew in Tennessee, Donald Whalen in Wyoming, and Jonathan Bryant in Ontario. And then we also name our retired missionaries, and we have Bruce Smith, Mike Watson, Lynn Burrell, Louise Crawford, Hal Jacks, Elizabeth Jackson, Clarence Lance, Morley Mason, Betty Walker, and Blanche Webster. And it asks that we pray for all our missionaries to lift them up and their extended families, many who will be a part this holiday season. And we are asked to pray for peace and comfort and an awareness of His presence with all. 
Now, this year we are focusing on Mexico City. And if you were to see a map of reached and unreached countries, you would see Mexico is considered a reached country. And if you look even further, Mexico City is considered a reached city. And so some have asked, well, why do we spotlight them if they're considered reached? Well, we all know that we're commissioned to go and preach the word until the very last person. So even if there's one person left, we are supposed to still preach and try to reach that one person. But, and I didn't realize it, I probably knew it, but didn't realize it. To be considered a reached country or a, un, or a reached city, only 10% of the population has to be considered evangelist Christians. Only 10%. So that leaves 90% that's still out there. Mexico City is considered a mega city. It became a mega city in the 1970s when it reached a population of 10 million. It is now, this year, they have said that they have over 21 million people there. And a whole whopping 3 million are considered evangelical Christians. Sounds good to you realize 3 million from 21 is 18 million people are still wandering around lost. So that is the reason that we are focusing on them. And Mexico City is also considered a gateway city. They have businesses coming in from all over the world that's bringing their, some of their people in. So it's bringing in different languages, different cultures, different traditions, different religions. They have people coming in from the rural areas to search for better lives. They have refugees coming in from Central America and South America searching for freedom. Maybe they're escaping persecution, um, poverty. They're searching for better. So they're all ending up there. As a result, Mexico City has rich, poor, immigrants, refugees, nationals, they have businessmen, they have street vendors, and they're all together, mishmash. They all rub shoulders at one time or the other. The city is very divided in that you have the modern communities that have the nice houses. Um, most of them are fenced and gated. Then you have the ones that are just the moderate houses. And then you have the very poor section. And then you have sections that unless you know somebody and they escort you in and out, you don't go in. And this is a very, very hard thing for our missionaries there. Currently, there is an international mission team, and there are four couples that serve on it. Now, they have others that help, of course. They have volunteers. They have mission groups that go down, and they take them on prayer walking through a lot of the city, through the businesses, through the markets, but the head of it says there are some places that he cannot allow these people to go because he cannot guarantee their safety. He says, matter of fact, some of our missionaries can't even get into this area. He also has help from the local pastors there, and he has help from the various other people that come in. One of them is a... Um, displaced pastor from Venezuela. He was a pastor there for 20 years. Um, he was being severely persecuted and to get, he had to get out. He was either get out, go to jail and disappear or leave the country. Unfortunately, he said he was able to get out, but his wife and children haven't been able to get out and it's been three years and the government won't let them come out. So he does ask for prayer to, um, help hopefully his he said his to get his wife and, and children there he says right now he's working as a single man he said so I can pretty much go and just spend all day he said but he said I need my wife because she is like the person that can walk in and go you know we may should do a music class over here or why don't we hold a little children's festival over here he says she has this great vision 
and we worked well together in Venezuela, he said, and I do solely miss her. And then we have our missionaries. Um, and then we have a group of missionaries, and these are sort of interesting missionaries. They are Chad and Crystal, and they have two sons. They are missionaries to missionaries. If you have a housing need, a transportation need, a logistics need, you got problems with your visa, you call Chad. He takes care of you. You have some sort of medical problem, you need doctors, you need hospitalization, you need something, or you're having some other problems, then you call Crystal. She takes care of you. They have a house that if you need to come and stay, you don't have to worry about finding a place to stay. They live in a quiet, upscale neighborhood simply because, she says, when our missionaries come, they're usually coming off of a very bad problem or coming out of some serious situations. And she said, so sometimes it's nice for them to be able to come, have a quiet place to stay that they feel safe in. They also, their two sons also helps with the children of the missionaries that have to come in. She says they have become quite accomplished youth ministers, babysitters, uh, guides, or anything else. And she says they'll tell you if it weren't for them, we couldn't have our ministry. And she said, and so many times that is true because they take care of the younger kids while we take care of their parents. But the international mission team is made up of, like I said, four couples. Aaron and Sophia are one, and that is not their real name. And it doesn't say why they changed it, but I can only imagine they may be working in an area of the town that they don't want people to know who they really are. Aaron is American, and Sophia is Filipino. And Aaron works mostly trying to get the local churches involved in different areas. He says that if he can get the local churches to start branching out and reaching out to their people, he thinks that a door will open. He said because it's so hard to get in. They All of the missionaries have said it's very hard to work trust up. And all they need, though, is to get a crack. If they can just get that door cracked, he says, usually we can swing the door wide open. He also tries to encourage the people not to be afraid because there's a lot of superstition that crosses um, economics, social, that still goes on. They all believe in the evil eye. They believe in fortune tellers. They believe that shaman can, if you're having a run of bad luck, go see a shaman and he'll burn his sage and chant around you and dance around you and, and your bad luck will go away. And they also believe in your ancestors and worshiping your ancestors and you respect your ancestors. He said, so he's trying to teach them that it's okay to break away. And Sophia says, she tries to tell them it's okay to be afraid. She's Filipino, and she says, and it will be difficult maybe to go into someplace else or try to talk to people who don't believe exactly like you believe. But it's okay as long as you're doing God's will because he will not leave you. Then we have James and Gina. Now, they work outside Mexico City in the little surrounding villages and towns outside, and they say, yes, being different can be a challenge, but it can also help you. They are both Americans, but they're of Korean descent. And they say their differences has actually allowed people to come to them and ask questions about where they come from, which has opened the door to conversation. And they say that's all we need is just to be able to open that door and walk in. Then we have Carlos and Lily. Carlos was born in Cuba and lived there until he was 12. Lily was born in the country of Colombia. And I'm not going to go into a lot about them right 
the second because I'm going to spotlight them because they have a very interesting story. And, of course, they couldn't see it then, but looking back, they can see God's hand on them all the way through. Um, Lily did make the comment. She said she just couldn't understand why God just didn't go ahead and take her and just not make her go through all this. But she says, but then I realized that his ways are not my ways. And if I had not been allowed to go through what I went through, I wouldn't be as sensitive to some things that, um, as I am. And then the leaders are Rick and Kelly. And Rick is of Cuban descent, but he was raised in the States. And Kelly, they describe as an all-American girl. And they have three children. Now, you heard me say that the other, the, the rentals, the ones that are missionaries to missionaries and their two sons and how they couldn't do the ministry without them and they've been uprooted all their lives, but they love it. Kelly says, I wish I could say that about my three. She said, between 2011 and 2014, we moved four times. Every year we moved. So we lived in Peru, and then we lived in Ecuador, and then we lived in Venezuela, and then we got to Mexico. And she said, when we went into each country, we talked to our children and told them about the customs and the traditions and the culture. And she said, and our oldest one was 12 years old when they moved to Mexico. And said, we were telling them about this. And he said, no, I don't care. And they said, what are you talking about? He says, I'm done. I'm done. What do I care? We're going to move every year. So what difference does it possibly make? So she said, that, that was a bit of a worry. And we prayed about it. And we told God, we knew he would help us, but. You know, if there was anything he could do to let us maybe stay for a while. They've been there six years now. So I, <laughs> but said, um, so she said, we were there for like two and a half years. And she said, and I, and the kids had just started school because she said, we weren't sure what we were going to do. And I'd been homeschooling. And she said, so, and we'd been going to different churches. My husband's a church planner and we've been doing all of this and said, well, she said, I heard the kids talking one day, and she says, I eased up to the door because I wanted to hear because they were talking about living here and said they were like, you know, it's okay, but we don't particularly like it. And she said, I thought, what's going on? We've been here. Why? And it comes back to one of your points this morning when you're talking about getting the kids back in. And the other one said, says, yeah, I know. Says, I'm so tired of going with Daddy every Sunday to a different church. I want a home church. I want a church that I can walk in and they know me as me and not the missionary's kid. Says, and they were like, we want to join choir. We want to do Christmas plays. We never have had the opportunity because we never had a home church. And I wasn't going to tell that story, but after he said that this morning, I thought, well, maybe that I need to tell that story. They, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she said they did. They, they picked a church, and she said, and we started going there. She said, sometimes Rick had to go other places. And she said, as they have gotten older, sometimes I went with Rick, and they went to, the, to their church and said, it has made the world a difference. Because now they feel, between the school and the church, they feel that they belong. And said they are really thriving and doing well. And the oldest son left this year to go to college. He's now 18. And she said that um, as they were leaving, he was like, you know, I think I like this place the best of all the ones we've been to. She said, so, she says, I can see God's work on, on this. Now I'm going to tell you the story of Carlos and Lily. Carlos was born in Cuba, and he went to church with his family, and he went back and forth, and he said, we always went past this building, and we knew it was a church, 
He said, but about eight years old, I got to notice of something. He said, those people in that church were singing. And they were laughing. And they were happy. He said, and my church was very somber. And you went and you sat and you, you he said, there was no laughing and there was no talking and there was no joyous singing. He said, it was all so very somber. And he said, I just couldn't believe that this church was doing that. He said, so he got to where he would go by and straggle behind and stand at the door. And he said, one day I just got the nerve up and he said, I came in and I sat on the back pew. And this man saw me. His name was Pablo Lavina and said, he he would spoke to me and said, and I kept going back and sitting on the back pew and he and several others started noticing me and says he invited me to join a group that he led each week. But he said we had to be careful because even though churches were allowed at Cuba at that time, you couldn't do certain things, so you had to keep it quiet and under the radar. He said, so I was very excited. He said, and we went, and there was um, about eight or nine of us, and he said, we learned about mission and we learned about scripture. And he said, I finally went home, dug through the house and found a little Bible. He said, now pages were falling out, but I'd stuff them back in and, and take it. And he said, and that was my Bible. And he said, I was so thrilled. He said, and the name of the group was the Royal Ambassadors. We know them as the RAs. So it was a Southern Baptist church that he, that he found. They was one better than that. <laughs> huh? There was one deader than that. Where he was going, it was deader than the Southern Baptist. Oh, yeah. He was going to. <laughs> These people were laughing and singing. Yeah. So he said he continued to um, with that group for four years, and then his father got a job in the state, so he had to leave. And he said, now, all that time, I never gave my life to Christ, but he said, it was always in the back of my head. He said, I remembered my scripture. He said, and I still carried my Bible. He said, I still had that little Bible. So we're going to end his story. We're going to talk about Lily. Lily had quite a life. Lily grew up in the country of Columbia. And she didn't move to America until she was about 25 years old. And while she lived there, she said, we went to church every now and then. She said, I had um, relatives that were in the uh, Santorina. She said, we did fortune telling. We went to mind readers. We went to tarot card readers. She said, and we really didn't believe in any of it and just went and did it. She said, but when they moved to America, she said, we moved into a community that... Um, had a lot of Cuban immigrants in it, and said Santorina was a very big religion there. And she said, I, she said, I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared of it. I, I knew about it. She said, because I had relatives that practiced it. And it was really not a big thing, but she said, here it was a very big thing. And I just want you to know, if anybody ever tries to talk to you about Santa Rhea, run. It is a super scary um, religion. They believe in um, seeking knowledge of the spirits, manipulating the spirits. Um, they don't really have a church. It's very informal. Um, but they believe that um, you... You do prayers to your ancestors, and um, they do have many, many gods. They don't always call them gods. They have one creator, the Alo Du Mere. They got him, and then they've got other spirits that interact with the humans. And she got involved with that because they promised her power, and material possessions. And she said it seemed like everybody who was involved with it, they had nice cars and televisions and 
money. And she said, and I thought, well, this must be something. So she said, I, I got involved in it. Well, they came to her and they said, we'd like for you to become a high priestess. And she was like, she was honored and thrilled that she could be a high priestess in this. One little catch with them. You have to pay to be a high priestess. $10,000. And she told them, she says, I, I don't have $10,000 that I can do that, but thank you for offering it, and I will start saving up, and maybe in a year or two I can do that. So she said that was the end of it. A couple of days later, one of the leaders came, and they told her, says, I have been talking to the spirits, and the spirits said that you are to be a high priestess. And she was like, I appreciate it, but I can't afford it. And they went, no, no, no. The spirits have said you are to be a high priestess. Therefore, there is no charge for you because they want you to be a high priestess. So she was very <coughs> thrilled, very honored. And she said, so she agreed. And as the days started getting closer to the ceremony that takes place at 3 a.m. in the morning, she said, I became a little anxious. And she said, I thought, well, it's probably just excitement. But she said, I kept thinking, no, this is not excitement. This is sort of like fear. And she said that she got off work, went home, and was going to go to bed before the, she had to get up and go to the 3 a.m. ceremony. And she said her mother came in and said, you need to be careful. You need to pray about this. And she said, so for the first time in a long time, instead of praying to the spirits, I prayed to God. And she said, I went to sleep and into a deep, deep sleep. And she said, I had the most horrible nightmare. She said, I saw myself laying on an altar in a pool of blood. And she says, I thought, she says, I woke up and thought, mm, sign from God, I'm not doing this. And she didn't. The next day, the one who had came to her, came to where she worked and just started yelling and screaming at her and cursed her. Told her she would never, ever get married. If she did get married, it would be an unhappy marriage. Her and Carlos have been married for over 20, for about 25 years now told her she would never have children. She would make her barren. She has three. So she was. She said, I was just mortified. And she said, later that night, I went to see a friend um, who was in it and who was a high priestess. And she said, I told her what was going on. And she he said she was told, well, she said, they told you you were favored by the spirits, that the spirits picked you? And she said, yes. And she said, what, do I have to pay anything? And she said, yeah, how do you know? She said, well, in order to become a high priestess, we have to do a human sacrifice. And they go to the spirits, and one person out of that group is picked. And that is the human sacrifice, and you were supposed to be it. So she said, that just sort of terrified me. And she said, so I stayed away from it. But she said, I still didn't go to God, but I stayed away from that. She said, a little bit later, guess who she met? Carlos. And they got married. Nine months later, she had a child. Now, Carlos was working, and they lived in this little apartment. And she said, I didn't know anybody, and she said, so I watched a lot of TV, and she says, I started watching this religious program. And she said, I, the more I watched it, the more I got listening, and she said, finally one day, I said the baby was asleep, and she said, and I thought, there's something happening to me. And she said, I just got down on my knees right then and there and prayed, and asked God to come into my heart, and she said, I just felt this warmth come all over me. She said, so, I, she said, but I didn't know what to do. She said, I didn't know where church was. I didn't know anybody to ask, so I called the program, 
And God's hand, again, the person on the phone told her, says, well, I can tell you what you need, honey. You need to find a Baptist church. And she said, okay. And she says, I hung up. And then she says, I thought, what is a Baptist? I had no idea what a Baptist was. <laughs> she says, so I wasn't sure how to tell Carlos all of this. She says, so I was trying to think what would be the best way. And said, so when he come, came in, she says, I, he said, she said, I got some great news to tell you. I hope it's great news to you. And he said, well, I got better news to tell you. I've got a promotion, so we're going to find a new place to live. We're going to get us a house. So she says, well, that's great. She says, I got saved today. And he went, well, good for you. <laughs> she said it was like, okay. She said, but we moved into a house. And she said, while we were moving, she said, I noticed there was a little church about a block from us. And she says, I told Carlos the whole thing about the warmth and the peace and and how I was told to find a Baptist church, but I didn't know who what a Baptist was. And he said, well, I do, because he had been there when he was eight, between 8 and 12. He said, I know what it is. He said, and that's fine. The church a block away from him was a Baptist church, Spanish-speaking Baptist church. So they go, and everybody is talking to him after the service, and this man walks up and he says, Carlos, is that really you after all these years? And he turned around and looked. His RA teacher, leader, Pablo, him and his wife had immigrated from Cuba and they were at that church. So they said, looking back, they can see God's hand on everything. And that's what Lily says. If... God had saved her way back when, she wouldn't be as sensitive to some of these women in Mexico and other countries because they served for 10 years in the Dominican Republic as she is. She said, because I can understand how easy it is to be lured into these cults, how easy it is to be led astray. And she said, and because of that, she says, I have a very strong women's ministry. She says, and anybody on the fringe, I can understand and talk to them. And Carlos says, well, he said, and I'm just here to say, after he was saved, he said, it was a seed planet when I was eight, and I was way older, way, way older, he said, before it ever took place. And then Lily said she prayed for four years because she felt a call working for the WM, working and being part of the WMU and the church. She said, I started feeling a call to do missions. Carlos said, we've got a good, we've got a good job. <laughs> we've got a good life. We don't need to do this. And she said, after four years, he said, you know, let's go. And they took three kids and went to... Uh, Dominic Republic stayed there for 10 years and then got called to Mexico where they're at now so they've had a very interesting life very interesting life and God's hand was truly truly on them Amen. now Rick has made up a list of some barriers that those that they face one of the things that they face in Mexico City is the fact that ancestors are so revered. There is a square in Mexico City. In the center of it, it's about 10 football fields long. One side is the palace that's the federal government building. And on the other side, he said, is all our barriers. Now, the first barrier is the Metropolitan Cathedral. The full name of this is the Metropolitan Cathedral of the Assumption of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary into Heaven. It is a huge, huge church, one of the largest in the Americas. It took 250 years to build. It's like 300 feet long, 200 feet wide, bell tower, 
215 feet up in the air, 25 bells, 14 chapels covered with gold, priceless paintings. The Archdiocese of Mexico has offices there, and all the archbishops of Mexico are buried in the crypts there. So it's a huge, huge church, and people make pilgrimages to see this, to come to this church because of it. And to understand why that's a barrier, you have to understand that back in the 1400s, the Spanish came over and conquered the Aztecs that were living in this area for the Mex for the um, that Mexico City is now. But let me let me tell you a, a funny. This is this really is. There was a group of people that were nomadic, and they believed that they had to stay moving, that they couldn't settle down permanently until they got a sign for their gods, and they worshipped many deities at the time. And the sign was an eagle with a snake in its mouth sitting on a cactus. And if they ever saw that sign, they could settle down permanently. They went in a valley that had a huge lake and many lakes and rivers. And in the middle of the biggest lake, there was an island. And there was an eagle with a snake in his mouth sitting on a cactus. That is where Mexico City is located. That was the beginnings of Mexico City. And they had to build aqueducts to get the water from the, from the ground. Those ducts are still being used to this day, and that was pre-1300s. But anyway, in the 1400s, the Spanish came in and conquered the Aztecs. And one of the things that they did, they talked about how beautiful the city was. It rivaled Venice. They had big canals hanging flowers. They had gardens built. Just gorgeous. Of course, that didn't stop them from tearing everything down and destroying it. And when they did, they filled in the lakes. They destroyed the buildings, except for a couple of things. Um, but one of the first things they did destroy was the Aztec temple that was used for human sacrifices and to worship their gods. And they, eve and they conquered all the Aztecs, and they told them, you are Catholic. You are now Roman Catholic. You will worship Roman Catholic, and if you don't, you can be punished or put to death. So everybody became Roman Catholic. Protestant missionaries did not get there until the 1800s. So everybody has been Catholic. And they say that is a very big problem now. Doesn't matter if you go. Doesn't matter if you even like the church. You are Catholic. And your parents were Catholic. Your grandparents were Catholic. Your aunts and uncles were Catholic. Your great-grandparents. All the way back, everybody was Catholic. So you are Catholic. And if you leave, you have disgraced the family. You have displeased your ancestors, and the family will turn on you. Will turn on you. Barrier one. Barrier two is a cathedral called the Lady of Guadalupe. Now, this was in the 1500s. Farmer went out, went to his fields. An apparition appeared to him. Looked like the Virgin Mary of the Roman Catholic Church, but it was different. She had the same skin tone, the same hair, same eyes, and she spoke to him in his native language. So she told him she wanted a chapel of her own to be honored, and she would help them. He runs to the priest, tells the priest this, and the priest sort of goes, yeah, okay, um, go, go home. <laughs> Didn't believe him. This happens two other times. Finally, the priest said, okay, I'm tired of messing with you. Get me proof. 
prove to me that she exists. So she appeared to him again. He told her that the priest he'd been to him three times didn't believe him. He wanted proof. She says, okay, go to this certain hill. And he's like, there's nothing on that hill but rock. She said, go to the hill. Supposedly he went to the hill. There were flowers. He took the flowers, presented them to the priest, had them in his cloak, dumped it out. And when he dumped it out, there was an image of her on his cloak, which the priest took, hung up, and they built her a chapel. And that cloak is still hanging in that chapel today. It's in a case, environmentally controlled. It's a huge chapel, round, moving sidewalks. You can go see a movie about it. People come once a year for pilgrimages or come there, and they bring their statue. They may bring pictures and ask for blessings and ask for help. She's known as a miracle worker. And there is nothing stopping them. They'll go to the cathedral, worship there, and then walk over to this cathedral or this chapel and ask this Mary for some sort of help. And when they ask them about, well, why didn't you stay and, and pray to Jesus or God and, and ask him for help, they'll tell you there's no difference between praying to Mary and praying to Jesus because Jesus is Mary's son. And she has powers of her own. And if she can't do it, she just goes over and talks to Jesus. So I guess, you know, they live next door to each other or whatever. But he says, there's nothing wrong with that in their sight. So when you go into their homes, you've got the Virgin Mary, Roman Catholic Virgin Mary, and you've got the Lady of Guadalupe. And it's even to the point now that there, some people have tired of the church hierarchy and they just go to the Virgin Mary of Guadalupe. But this is the most scary barrier. Santa Myrta. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. But this is the goddess of death. And she is a skeleton. She wears a robe. Sometimes she's got a sickle. Sometimes she's got an orb. Sometimes both. And she is the one that is supposed to give protection. And she has been a favorite of the drug lords and, and those in prison because they say she does not discriminate. She doesn't care. As long as you bring her offerings, which would be candles, fruit, flowers, shots of tequila, Cigarettes, cigars, pot, it don't matter. Just as long as you bring her something, she will take care of you. And so they get tattoos on her. They build shrines of her. And people worship her. And even though the Catholic Church says do not worship her, they still do because they feel that she's a protector. And it shows you how the scripture gets turned around. And this is a, 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 a scary fact. This cult is one of the fastest growing religions. She already has 10 to 12 million followers. And there are temples or churches, whatever you want to call them, here in the United States for her. And... This is their philosophy on her, that she was made by God for a single person, for a single purpose, and her pur purpose is to carry you to death, carry you over. She doesn't judge, um, and you can go to her because she has no rules. And the church says if you don't obey these rules, you can't go to heaven, but she doesn't say that. And this is a good one. There's a priest out in California of her, and they interviewed him, and he says, well, yes, he worshiped her because God made death 
twisted the scripture because God did not make death. God overcame death. But they say God made death, so, and she is the one that comes and gets you. So you want to be on good terms with her. But he says, of course he's a Christian because anyone who believes in Jesus is a Christian. So it doesn't matter. Now, he holds Bible studies, but got to notice and nobody else in his group has Bible studies. So he gets some of his information and twists it around. But there was actually one who built a temple for her, built a 72-foot statue of this skeleton. And we know in Brazil they had the Redeemer with the arms outstretched. That's how he made this skeleton. She's dressed in a black robe, and she's got her arms outstretched. He was killed outside the temple, shot to death. He was a drug dealer. His mother took over, and she died of cancer shortly after. So, and they did ask one and one of the missionaries says he did speak to a, a, a drug dealer. And he said, why, why would you worship her? And he says, well, he said, you know, he said, I need protection for my drugs and for my, for my runners and everything. And he said, so I don't want to, um, he said, you know, I don't feel right going to Jesus or God or Mary to ask for any of that because, well, they look down upon that. But it's okay with her. <laughs> so this this is very big, especially in some of these poor neighborhoods. You'll see shrines outside businesses, outside homes, all set up. And I will show you the barrier. There was a man, his name was Jesus, and he worked in a store. And he had a shrine set up for his Santa Marta. In his house, he, him and his wife had the Roman Catholic Virgin Mary, had the Lady of Guadalupe, and had the Santa Murda, all in their house. And he started developing back problems. Now, this was 45 years ago, but he tells his story. And he said it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And he said there was a salesman that kept coming in and asking him, why don't you come to church with me? Let my church pray for you. Let us put your hands on you. And he told him no. He would not enter the door of a evangelical church because he was Catholic. Now, he had all of them statues, but he was Catholic. And finally, his wife said, enough is enough. We've tried everything. Nothing works. You need to go to this church, and let's just see if anything happens. So, he went to church. Five pastors came together after service and prayed over him. And he said he had, he had to wear support belts and everything else. And he said all of a sudden, he said it was like this ray came down from the sky and covered me. He said I felt the light. I felt the warmth. He said and it just surged through my body. And when it did... He said, all of a sudden, I felt no pain as I was standing there. He says, I took off my support belt, threw it down. He said, and I have never had another day's pain. That brought him to Jesus. Amen. His wife soon also came to Jesus. And the first thing they did was they took out all their statues, took out everything, got rid of it. He took the altar down in front of his store, got rid of it, because he said he didn't need that protection. He was protected by God. His family was furious. First of all, he disrespected the ancestors because he left the Catholic Church. He disrespected the Lady of Guadalupe, his own kind, because that's how they feel about her, that she is one of them. He's disrespecting her. So the whole family said, forget it. We will not come to your house. We won't talk to you. We're done with you. And they said, well, we're sorry, but we're not coming back. So said they still try to talk to the family and said, um, 
She says, I went to, and the wife says, she went to her sister and tried to talk to her sister, and her sister's mother-in-law told her they couldn't, they wouldn't even allow her in their house. And they told her, says, we will die before we set foot in your house. They died shortly after that comment. Other family members thought, hmm, they started talking to them, and several have become saved now. So Rick and the other missionaries, they talk about prayer walking, and they said it is for these reasons that they have to prayer walk, and it takes time to gain trust. But said once that crack is there, once it says these people are dying to know the gospel, said they won't know, and they are surprised really that it is as easy as it is. They don't have to have tributes. They don't have to do rituals. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to bring an offering to get protection, to get help, to feel better, to get peace. And so they, many of them say they have never, never had that before. So they ask that we remember them. Pray for them. They said, especially sometimes when they go on their prayer walking. Said, we go into areas that we don't let a lot of people go into. But said, especially Rick, he says, I've been walking and my phone's got off. And he said, I've looked at it. And it's um, somebody from a church and says, you know, we got a feeling that you might need help. So we've developed, we are um, doing a prayer chain. Are you okay? And he says, you have no idea how much better I feel knowing that I got people praying for me as I'm walking through here. Um, Carlos has said that one of the vital things that he's trying to do is to get the existing churches going. He said, we've got to keep our churches alive. He says, making, planting new churches is wonderful, but we have got to help our existing churches. He said, so I do discipleship. He says, I have classes for pastors, classes for the deacons, classes for anybody that wants to come to teach them. He says, so he says, we're encouraging the local churches and we need prayer for more people to help with the local churches. The hardest place they say they have is in the wealthier neighborhoods. He said, because they tell me, look, I've got my, my altars. I'm doing good. I'm not going to mess that up. So it is a constant day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day battle. One said that he couldn't get anybody to talk to him. He said, so I finally decided, okay, God, you're going to have to help me out here. He said he took a chair set out on the sidewalk every day for eight hours 10, 12, whatever, he said. And I did nothing but read my Bible and pray. And he says, I thought, surely somebody will say, what is this crazy man doing out here? And come talk to him. He said, it took a while. But somebody said, what are you doing? He said, my door was open. We now have a church of 20. He said, so, he said, we happen to do some talking and walking and building trust. He said, but all we need is that crack. And as soon as God gives us that crack, he flings open that door and said, um, one said he was in Venezuela. He said he, in 20 years, the one that was, had been there, he said, I have, he said, I could start, I started eight churches in 20 years. He said, but in the time I've been here, he said, I've been able to start five community churches. He said, it's so important to get into these communities and get these people to feel like they have a place to come that they can be comfortable. He said, they're asking for the gospel, but they're afraid because they don't want to go against the ancestors. They don't want to go against the beliefs, and they're afraid to break tradition. So they ask us to pray for the strength, for them to continue, and 
to help soften these people's heart and let them understand they're not going against anything. They're gaining. They're not losing protection. They're not losing somebody to help. They're not losing anything. They're gaining it all in one. All right, I'm going to ask the pastor to come forward. Name of uh, the, the one with the bones and the Santa Murta. Santa Murta. Uh -huh. okay. I've a, never heard of her. Lovely. Isn't it? Oh, and one thing I do want to tell you, and it's just outrageous. On the Santa Maria people, they do animal sacrifices. We as Christians can't put a nativity scene at a fire department, but a mayor at one of the cities that they operate in put a ban on animal sacrifices because he was outraged by it. They sued, went to court, and the court said because they are considered a religion that the mayor had no business banning that part. So, I mean, it just... The scripture here says, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, which is the place of the dead. We have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge and falsehood we have taken shelter. Mm -hmm. In other words, we'd rather take shelter in a lie than we had to take shelter in the truth. It's hard to go against that. And not only there, Becky, but everywhere. Some of the toughest people to reach are the well-to-do, the wealthy, the rich. The Bible says it's very difficult for a rich person to get into heaven. There's a reason for that. Because he thinks he deserves everything he got. And he believes that, that belongs to him. And that he earned it. And he doesn't understand that every good blessing we've ever got came from the Father above. Becky, I want to thank you because, see, they had first asked me about doing this, and I said, I ain't got time to study all that stuff now because you can tell by the depth of the things that she said how much time and study that she put into that and had it up, up here. And so I want to thank you for, for doing that for us and help us to realize that when we give to Lottie Moon that these are the people that are trying to go into these places with these people and what they're dealing with, and I'll tell you, you know, Jay sitting back there, the Catholic Church is a hindrance to the carry of the gospel in these places. I don't care what nobody says, and they may not like it, but I'm going to just tell you just by what you said. If you stop being one of them, what they do, they keep you out the house. You tell me how that is. But thank you, Becky. Thank you, church, for listening. And I want to go ahead and just go ahead and previously thank you for giving to help these people do a tough, tough job. That's tough. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for... Uh, the, the message that Becky has given us tonight and, and God has brought a realization into our mind of, of God, how good we've got it sometimes. These people that move all around the world like this family that have moved four places in four years. God, that these people that were looking for a church that somehow or another God come through somebody or something or listening to a music in a church and and God, that, that brought them in the door. Father, I thank you for people that are willing to serve and willing to go. And, and God, I thank you for the South 
Carolina Baptists and our National Baptist Convention that that God we're willing to support and to give to take the gospel into all the world and try to get as many saved as, as we can. And God, I pray that you would bless them in their work. God, I pray that you'd provide every need that they have. God, I pray you'd protect them. God, those are some dangerous places that they serve in, very dangerous, especially in a world today where it says, as I was reading an article the other week, God, where about 8,000 Christians get killed a day somewhere around the world. God, that, that Christianity is it's not welcomed, but God, it will prevail. God bless them now, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for being with us tonight.